Hello and welcome to a spooky edition of Starsight Chat. I am one of your hosts, Aaron, and with me as always is Zach. How's it going, Zach? Good. It is very spooky. This is our Halloween episode. Penultimate. So we do have a special feature where we're going to kind of run down five recommendations for Halloween games and then another five recommendations for Halloween movies, but these are for non-horror fans. So if yeah, you're not so big on horror games or movies, this spooky is be a good elements, list for you. but not necessarily like jump scares or like crazy stuff. Yeah, creepy stuff that'll give you nightmares, that kind of thing. We've also have you played more uh, Super Mario Bros. Wonder? Yes, I have a little bit, but I'm definitely okay. not super far. I my girlfriend is in her busy season, so she's not been at home much, and I'm only playing it while she's here. So I have. Uh, not played as much. At, I'm, I think I'm only on the second world. Gotcha. Yeah, I've played more of it. Uh, I've played further than that. I have played some co-op as well, so we can talk about that experience. Uh, so we'll get to that, but we do have some news to get to. Yes, there was a showcase or like a, a partner showcase that we'll talk about throughout the news segment. But probably the most interesting thing from it was the first in-engine gameplay of Metal Gear Solid Delta Snake Eater, which is the non-Kojima remake in Unreal Engine 5 of a classic game, Snake Eater, which I played a little bit of. Have you ever played Snake Eater? I have not. I bought a a couple of years ago. I was like, man, I should check out Metal Gear Solid because they had like a three-pack of... Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, and I think Peace Walker was also on there for PlayStation. And I was like, I'll check that out. Uh, I found, I mean, this is maybe just a symptom of the times, but I found both 1 and 2 to have controls that I just could not abide by. I couldn't deal with the fixed camera angles and just like the weird movement of it all. Mm. So I kind of dropped those. Uh, And then I also checked out Snake Eater, which has somewhat more traditional controls, but still antiquated. And I just, I don't know, I couldn't really make it past it. So I am pretty eager for this because I think it'll it be a like modernization. A, exactly. Yeah, it'll be playable to uh, someone with my sensibilities. Yeah. The only Metal Gear game that I have played was five and I, I didn't play much of it. I only maybe played through like the first hour or two. And because this, it was like a PlayStation plus game at one point. And so I, I downloaded it. Uh, I think it was around the time of like maybe Death Stranding where yeah. like Kojima's stuff was like, you know, top of mind. And so I was like, I should experience this. Uh, and so I started it, but like, I don't know. It didn't make it super far into it. It was really weird, uh, which sounds about right for a yeah. Kojima game. But uh, yeah, this uh, in-engine footage looks uh, pretty good. Looks well, pretty good, I gotta say. I gotta say. Yeah, the Unreal Engine 5. You can make some pretty crazy looking stuff in it. Now, they also showed at the showcase, and this was very interesting to me because do you remember this game, The Finals? Wasn't this something that we saw back at like Summer Games Fest or something in like Faux E3 where it was like, hey, we're like anarchists and we're going to like steal from these like corporate elites? But I don't remember at all it being in an arena setting. Like, it's basically just like a a game. There's like stadium seating all around the area where you're fighting. Do you remember that? I have no memory of this whatsoever. This was, it looked like a generic extraction shooter where like you were teams and you were all racing to steal from somebody. But this trailer, and maybe I'm thinking about a completely different game, but this trailer I was gonna say, th- quickly reveals that it's the, in a like, thing. Yeah, I was going to say, minus the, uh, like, crowd around the, like, outskirts yeah. of the the map, this looks like any number of, like, you know, multiplayer extraction shooters uh, that have come and gone, like, over the last few years. This isn't, I mean, if, I think people keep trying to get extraction shooters to be a thing, but it hasn't really popped off. Like, Tarkov, obviously, is still, people play Tarkov, but it's, like, the learning curve for that is so high, and people are maybe intimidated by having to figure out, I mean, I've watched people play that and it's, there is a lot of menu management in that. Um, 
but I don't think we've found a, like a mainstream extraction shooter that people have really taken to yet. And I think this wants to be that, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, something about how you like hold your hand out to pick up those boxes. For whatever reason, that rubs me the wrong way. What do you think of this trailer? I mean, it uh, it kind of looks cool. It, it looks a little bit like they're trying to do like a a little bit of a Tron thing. If you remember Tron Legacy, where they're in this like arena with a, like a crowd around them, mm, and every yeah. time they like hit them with their their disc, they like turn into <laughs> uh, like I don't know digital nonsense until they disappear. And uh, in this case, they turn into coins, I guess, which maybe you pick them up and it's some sort of currency that you can use. I don't know. know. Confusing to me. There's an open beta happening right now that we could be a part of, but I have not downloaded it. Yeah, I I don't know if it's like class based or or what's going on here, but yeah, I'm not sure. It it looks like they're trying to combine elements of like Rainbow Six Siege and, you know, like uh, any number of other shooters or whatever, but. It's interesting. Interesting. Uh, speaking of weird, interesting things that you can play right now, uh, Disney Dreamlight Valley is going to leave early access officially uh, on December fifth. But they have no; they've dropped plans to make it a free to play game. So it's going to continue to be like a paid game, which is a, a strange move to me. But I guess the the statement that they they had was that they i guess need it to be paid in order to continue uh to support the game uh, uh, that's sort of the basic gist of what they said but mm. what do you think of uh i guess promising a free to play game and then uh you know going back on that i actually am kind of for this because i think anytime i hear a free to play game i'm thinking like okay, the customer is actually the product. Like, uh, they're going to throw a bunch of crazy currencies at you and you're going to have to, or they're going to lock stuff out where like you, you plant a plant or something. And then it's like, well, now wait four hours or pay a Mickey dollar and it will immediately bloom. So I'm, I guess I'm pro them going away from the free to play model just because I found, I find that to be so like predatory and maybe this will lead to, like higher quality stuff where you're not constantly having to juggle five different currencies, but I've never played this game. So I don't know if that is actually the case currently or what the like meta is for how to like game the system in this. But in general, I think it's better to just have, I think for all software, I would say this, it's better to have a one-time upfront price as opposed to some sort of subscription or it's free, but like they're <laughs> collecting information on you or you have to like buy hats or something. They did say they're going to like offer sort of free content updates mm. that like add new characters and realms and like clothing and furniture and that kind of thing. But they, they do have like in game purchases that you can do. Mm. Uh, but supposedly those are going to remain optional and that they're supposed to be fair and, I guess not give you sort of advantages. I don't, I guess I don't know how that works. As long as they're cosmetic, I feel like that's always the rule of thumb is as long as all of the, it's like destiny where like you can't necessarily pay to win. You're just paying to like customize your guy. Um, Right. I'm fine with that. But if it's something where it's like, Hey, you can only have a two story house. If you pay like an extra $20, that seems bad to me. And I hope that is not the case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, for people who like cozy games, sort of Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing, this is like the Disney version. And I, I know there are people looking forward to this. I don't know if they've already dipped their toes in uh, while it was paid uh, to begin with. But the the fact that this was going to be a free to play game and is no longer a free to play game um, may rub people the wrong way. But uh, that was announced this last week. Uh, let's talk about Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. Zach, getting a lot of Infinite Wealth content these days. They released that prolonged gameplay video as well as, and I don't know if this was a good idea, <laughs> that prolonged story video that went through a bunch of story beats that's going to be in this game. And then at that Microsoft Partner Showcase that happened this week, 
uh, they revealed that, in fact, in addition to that story and all the other things they've shown, you can seemingly at any point in time get on a dolphin and ride to a magical island where it, it just becomes an Animal Crossing game. And you can collect things and really? capture bugs and uh, you can defend your island and build it out. You can build the main like uh, thoroughfare of your island as well as your house. You can upgrade your house and put special furniture and craft special furniture with materials that you've collected. And this is all just in the game. <laughs> this is the real end game of uh, this game. I could not have predicted this. Like, Like a Dragon yeah. was a crazy game, and I know that uh, these Yakuza games are known for being really insane, but uh, I could not have predicted that they would have an entire section of the game that was just Animal Crossing. I mean, I think every game developer is looking for a way to keep people engaged with their game, like, post, you know, just, like, the main story. Yeah. Because you release a game like this, they play through the game, and then they're like, oh, that was great, now I'm moving on. But if they can sort of hook you on, like, additional features, like some sort of multiplayer or, like, a, you know, cooperative mode that's just sort of an ongoing thing that gets support, um, I think this is an interesting way for them to do that that is not just, like, you know, oh, now we have our GTA Online thing, you know. Uh, and... Definitely, like, the cozy game uh, is, like, a hot trend in games right now. But I'm with you on not being able to have predicted that this would be the direction (laughs) they'd go for, like, a a method of keeping players engaged with the game. It seems cool. It also seems like... I think it's cool. So, uh, a hallmark of the Like a Dragon series, I guess there's only been one right now, but they're continuing with this one is turn-based combat, but on this island, it seems like it goes back to being brawling because every once in a while, villains will arrive, and it seems like you can just, like, beat them up with a bat. Yeah, I mean, it. uh, I I did like the turn-based combat better than the, like, sort of action brawler thing that I played in, uh, what was it, Like a Dragon Ishin Mm. from earlier this year. I, I preferred the the turn based stuff, which is strange because like if you go back and listen to our episodes, um, like as we're getting our initial pres- impressions of uh, Yakuza like a dragon, we were both sort of not hot on the uh, the turn based. They combat fixed it, I think, in this one because my main complaint with it was that you couldn't move your person around, so you sort of just yeah. had to. There were a lot of things where you were open for opportunity of attack things and like you couldn't really strategize. You could pick your moves you were going to do, but then there was a lot of the characters were just sort of arbitrarily moving around at the space. Yeah. So sometimes you would get screwed out of an opportunity. Well, and like uh, another hallmark of like of uh, Yakuza games is like you use the uh, environment as part of your combat. Yeah. So like you would pick up a, a bike and like hit someone with a bike and that's not really controllable in like a dragon because your character is just sort of ambling around as you're trying to pick your move. And so maybe they're next to a bike, but maybe if you took too long picking that attack, they've wandered a little bit too far. Now they won't interact with that bike. Yeah. So in like a dragon, infinite wealth, they have fixed it where you can move your people around, which I think is going to be a huge benefit, a huge improvement. Yeah. I will say uh, over time, over the course of that playthrough, as I got like more abilities and I like, you know, swapped up the different like classes that each of my characters had, um, I did like adjust to it more and grow to like it better. Mm. But yeah, that just the fact that they were sort of all moving and wandering around the space as you were like picking your moves was never something I particularly liked about it. But yeah, <laughs> the, it does seem like it'll be a vast improvement on the the previous game so that's good what's this metroidvania so there is a metroidvania uh coming next year that is called mars 2120 that's going to be on basically everything on pc and console and it is i think it's in maybe early access even right now but uh it's 
I was looking at uh, Gamatsu and they had an article about it. And I was like, I hadn't seen this before. But uh, it, yeah, it's basically a sort of sci-fi Metroidvania that's mm. like taking a lot of its cues from uh, Super Metroid and uh, Castlevania uh, Symphony of the Night. So, and they also mentioned Guacamelee as well. Interesting. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it looks cool. I watched the the little reveal trailer they had for it, and it does look really cool. Uh, I should look this up on Steam and see if it's still available in early access just to try it out. But it's getting an official launch. I think was the new piece of news on uh, March twenty eighth was the date that they had announced for it. But uh, another Metroidvania to put on your radar. Yeah. Hopefully 2024 will be the year of Silk Song. Yeah. <laughs> it could be the, the year of the Metroidvania in a big way because there's that and there's that uh, Mandragora game that I keep looking forward mm. to and I keep seeing them like release like little gameplay snippets on like Instagram and I'm like, man, I'm ready for this game to just come out because it <laughs> looks really cool. But uh, th- so far, no release date for that game either. So that Spider-Man game, everybody's playing it, uh, except us. <laughs> except us. By all accounts, seems it seems to be great. Really good reviews. Yeah. Insomniac is has been for I think the past two years. They revealed that Wolverine game they're working on two years ago, and this week they've come out and said, "Guess what? That Wolverine game takes place in the same universe as Spider-Man." So you might see some people popping up in each game. They're having, they're making their own cinematic universe within these games. It seems like. Is this now, interesting is it, to you? Well, so I'm interested more in the Wolverine game than I am the Spider-Man yeah. games. But I like with the movies and the TV shows from the MCU, I am basically completely out at this point. Mm-hmm. Like I just had, you know, superhero fatigue and uh, fell off after sort of the end of the uh, whatchamacallit the series infinity saga infinity saga that's what i'm looking for i basically fell off after that and have not i guess i did watch spider-man and doctor strange um but uh, uh, other than those two i have not watched anything and i do not feel like i'm missing out on anything yeah you're really not um Um, this i guess so they've said that whatever i don't know about the multiverse or whatever but both these games take place on Earth 1048, I think, for whatever that's worth. So it's interesting because Insomniac, I feel like, is all about movement in their games. Like they had, Insomniac made those, uh, that like Second Sun game, right? What is it called? Uh, yeah. Infamous. Infamous, yeah. And that was also just like jetting around a big city. And Wolverine's not really like a fast moving guy. So yeah. I'm, I'm very curious to see how this plays. I am as well. I uh, the point I was trying to make is I I don't like I've really fallen off of interest in superhero stuff when it comes to the movies. But for whatever reason, I'm more open to the Wolverine game, uh, mm. even if they are trying to build like a big sort of cinematic universe on the game side of things. I don't like it. Doesn't interest me a huge deal, but I'm more interested in it than the movies. And I wonder if. I don't think it is based on how the success of the Spider-Man games, but I was going to say, I wonder if other people are also feeling the superhero fatigue and they will maybe not buy into this as much, but it seems like the Spider-Man games are doing just fine. People love it. Yeah. Um, I didn't put this in the show notes because I, at this point think everything I'm hearing is a lie, but uh, the past couple weeks, every episode i've had like another different leak about a new far cry game if you recall i think initially i saw a leak that it was going to take place in like korea i want to say and then there was another leak that it was going to take place somewhere else but um i i saw another leak this week that i again have not linked because it's probably incorrect but i read that uh it's now far cry 7 is called far cry maverick and uh, previously, I think last week I said it was going to be called Mark, uh, Far Cry Rising, but um, it's the leak that I saw said it was like an extraction shooter only multiplayer with heavy survival elements where you have to have a safe house that you can share with other people similar to Rust. Um, 
I, I bring this up just because it seems like everyone wants to know what the next Far Cry game is and they're not saying anything. And there's like wildly different rumors floating around. Yeah. Uh, uh, that first one, I thought, I think I said a couple weeks ago that it was going to be like, sort uh, of a the death whole loop game style. Uh, yeah. The whole loop. game is going to be on a timer type of a thing, but I don't know. It's, it's very weird. And I wonder if, uh, we're getting these rumors because a reveal is imminent. I almost wonder if like the first rumor is true of the single player and then the Tarkov style thing is true of like a multiplayer mode. It's interesting. I, I, I'm i very curious to see where it ends up being set. But this is something I think is primed for a Jeff Keighley reveal at the Game Awards. I think he would that would be a big boon for him. As well as uh, this week, there was speculation from some communities online that we were going to get a GTA 6 reveal. That did not happen. But that's something else where I feel like uh keely could keely could get that exclusive and be it like blow everybody out of the water with like here is the first footage of gta 6 so i think it might be a good game awards if he can pull off these uh highly anticipated reveals i also i'll say this maybe he'll have some silk song stuff i feel like he knows people love silk song so i've been saying that for years but uh get ready for the game awards you're going to will it into existence (laughs) What's this patent? I actually am just reading this. So Game Rant had an article uh, just within like the last day or so where they showed that Nintendo patented what looks to be an awful lot like a 3DS device that is like dual screen but can split in half. And then you have sort of two separate halves that can communicate with each other wirelessly uh, which would allow two two people to play together on basically the same device. Um, that is crazy. Also, when you have it like folded shut, there's like a an, a touchscreen on the outside of the console that you can use basically as like a normal console, I guess. Uh, Man, like handheld console. Um, that's crazy. Now, this is crazy. Uh, I now it's worth noting that like they could patent any number of like designs for devices that will never see the light of day, and so this yeah. is not like a guarantee of a, a you know product that will eventually be sold to consumers. But it is very interesting just to see like what kinds of designs Nintendo is potentially working on for uh, future devices. Um, I, this could be any, like one of any number of weird random devices similar to this that they have been like working on and are, are trying to develop for potential release. But it makes me wonder if maybe they will bring something like this to market as like, you know, the successor to the 3ds and that maybe they will still have two different devices uh the way they have in the past where you have sort of a home console and a, a portable console if maybe they want to return to having two different devices um but i kind of hope they don't do that because i think it's yeah. better to have everything sort of united under the umbrella of one device that is both a home console and a portable device but uh this is a really interesting design i i do hesitate uh, on it because I like a big problem I have with the 3DS. I know people love that device, but I never used mine as much as I I would have if it was shaped and you know the controls were closer to what the Switch was because mm. I didn't like the flat thumbsticks and yeah you know just like the overall shape of it and the the dual screen stuff just seemed a little unnecessary like they tried to like there was you know a capacitive touchscreen on there and you had a little stylus for it and uh, there were a lot of times where you'd play something like pokemon it was like well the we we had to add this part where you can go <laughs> interact with your pokemon and you can like touch the touchscreen to like pet your pokemon it's just like this seems completely unnecessary, but also like totally something Nintendo would sort of force a developer to add just to like support the touchscreen. Like, look, yeah. we have this device with a, a touchscreen. You have to do something with it in your game. And Make a Pokemon like, that has long hair so you can brush the hair. 
Yeah. And it's just like, it's not really necessary. It's kind of like really dumb, but it had to be there because Nintendo mandated that this is how our device works and you must implement something in your game to take advantage of it. But I hope they don't go back to stuff like that. But I have on multiple occasions on this podcast, uh, gone on record as saying, I think that the uh, successor of the Switch is going to fold in some way. So I get what they're doing with this. Like, it's cool. It's cool right now with the Switch where you can, you know, set it up, take off the two Joy-Cons and two people can play together. It's a, a, an iteration of that for sure to be like, oh, now this thing splits in half and both of us get our own screen. Yeah. Um, it's a cool idea, but I also don't know how viable that is. But I don't yeah. know. I, I'm, innovation is cool. So I'm pro them mixing it up, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it does seem like a cool <clears throat> thing. And it does also seem like, uh, you know, a likely approach that Nintendo would take to sort of a successor to the 3DS that, that takes a page out of the Switch's book and like allows you to separate something so that two people can play together on the same device but um i also don't know if it's you know it follows that the success of the switch would demand another sort of 3ds style device but um let's talk apex legends yes you and i have been uh playing apex legends off and on over the couple, last couple of days or weeks, and I'm into it. I'm liking it. I feel like I have, for a long time, I have been chasing that like initial. Uh, what am I trying to say? That initial magic that PUBG had right when it came out. When PUBG came out, all of a sudden people, everybody was playing it. And people were like, "Isn't this crazy?" Every YouTube channel had PUBG highlights. And I dove in on PC and it was a lot of fun. It was very exciting. Every time you dropped, I got to know that first map really well and never really engaged with Fortnite until very recently. Um, But I have been trying to recapture that magic of a battle royale that I am into. And, you know, uh, I've tried to go back to PUBG a couple of times and it's just like, it's very... I mean, it's, it's not, I want to say it's difficult. I want to say it's uh, a lot of people are very good at it because they never stopped playing it. Um, And it's very easy to just like get shot by a sniper from across the map. But uh, I played a little bit of Fortnite this year and it was pretty fun. And uh, what's the other big one I'm forgetting? Oh, we played, you and I had tried to play Warzone, but we weren't, didn't really click with us, but I have really been liking Apex and I've been playing it almost every night. And season 19 is on the horizon. It's coming out on, I believe, the 31st, which is next Tuesday as we're recording this. And I am excited for it. There, uh, I wanted to shout out this guy, Tim Provision. He has a YouTube channel that I find to be very helpful and useful for learning about Apex and just like knowing what the current meta is. He makes these like very succinct, very quick moving videos about like every legend that you can play as and like weapons and tips and things like that. And I've uh, in the show notes, I've linked to his uh, impressions video on season 19 where he goes over, they're adding a new legend, which is a support legend. And they're also changing a bunch of things. And uh, Zach, I'm all about it. I am very into apex legends right now. And I think I actually will buy the battle pass for apex legends when it comes out on Tuesday. But um yeah, what do you think about did you uh, engage with any of this? Do you have you seen the stuff about the new legend conduit? I'm just watching it now as we speak and it does seem interesting. I do like support class uh, style characters and this one does seem interesting. Uh, yeah, w- we've had fun playing Apex like off and on over the last couple of weeks. And I definitely like that they have added new modes where you can play sort of more traditional like first person shooter online modes like a uh, you know like a control style mode or a uh, a team deathmatch style mode but uh yeah i i'm into it as well i think i might join you in getting the the season pass if you get one uh and then we'll we can play together more but uh yeah it's also a busy time of year with like a lot True. of games coming out I want to finish 
Super Mario Brothers Wonder, and I know Super yes. Mario RPG is on the horizon, as is Imminent. that... Um, what is that game? Uh, Star Ocean, the second story R that I talked a little bit about. Yeah. The, the demo a couple of weeks ago that looks pretty good. I, I kind of want to play that as well. So uh, my fear with season passes is always that I'm going to get it and initially I'm going to play a good amount of it and then I'm just going to fall off and never sort of get my money's mm. worth out of it. But mm. I mean, if you're also playing it and that like adds the incentive because it I will... I think that I will. I... I've really been like, I mean, the we talked about it before, but the usability, like the, all the, um, what's it called? The like quality of life things that Apex mm, has as opposed yeah. to like Warzone or even PUBG. Like I, for some reason, I'm just, it's really clicking with me over these last couple weeks and I, uh, I will play more of it. I, I, we'll see how the weekend goes, but I mean, as of right now for like two weeks straight, pretty much I've been checking it out pretty regularly. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, and like I was like I was talking about, I think just having, you know, somebody else to play with will make me more inclined to play it more. So I think that would definitely uh, get me to buy the season pass. And like we talked have about you, last week, the fact that it's free to play and I don't have to sub is. to the expensive tier of Game Pass in order to also be able to play it online. I mean, that well, makes so a difference this is, as well. Speaking of free to play, this is what I was going to ask you just now is uh have you thought about i've been doing a lot of research because i think i might purchase my first legend have you thought about which one you would like to play as not really i need to look up uh, like i'm sure there are tier lists of tim provision has a great tier list oh does he i'll look his up and uh see which one what one would you get I actually am thinking I might play as that Lobo, who is that woman who can make that black market appear, because I think that would be super fun and would minimize... I feel like a lot of times when I don't have a good match, it's because I spent way too much time trying to find uh, the equipment that I wanted, and I wasn't able to. And with her, you can just drop that down and have that like radius of things you can pick up. Mm. And that would allow me to very quickly get a kit that I would be able to play with. And also she can teleport, which I like. Yeah. Yeah. That does seem like a good one to have. I mean, maybe just like for the sake of, you know, the new thing that's there. Maybe if I do get the season pass, I'll just get the new character conduit and try. She has some cool. So her things are, she can refill people's shields, which is really cool as her tactical ability. And then also, if she's far away from you, she can like rush towards you. She gets a speed boost similar to how Bangle or gets a speed boost when she's getting shot at. But you sort of have to like look at your teammates and then you get the speed boost. And then her ultimate is she drops like a a wall of stuff that I guess like slows you down, but also maybe affects your shield or stuns you rather. Um, but it looks cool. I she looks like a, she's gonna be a cool legend to play as. Yeah, so uh, going forward, you'll you can tune into our uh, "It's Time to Talk About Apex" segment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're bringing back the "It's Time to Talk About" segment. What used to be about Destiny, but now I guess it'll be about Apex. But uh, I mean, if, hey, if they uh, if they bring out a battle royale for Destiny, I could see that revitalizing that game, and I would tr- definitely check that out. I think that's what they're doing with that. What is that new game they're releasing? That's like bringing back marathon. Old, yeah, marathon. Is that yeah, now what I'm that is in that. basically supposed to be? I'm curious to see. I never played the original Marathon, um, but I do like that trailer a lot. And I have watched it a couple of times just because I like the music in it and the, the weird aesthetics. But uh, yeah, yeah if, if I could get like d- bungee style shooting in a battle royale, that's very yeah. interesting to me. Yeah, that does seem pretty cool. Yeah, that that's another like the the shooting like it, the way the game feels is one of the reasons yeah. i never really got into pubg in a big way because it just like does not play as smoothly uh, as something yeah. like apex it's too does. realistic yeah I, I mean apex just like feels really good to play uh mm. and like you said they have all those nice quality of life improvements on the battle royale um that you don't get with something like PUBG or even Warzone. Warzone has its own little nice features that PUBG also does not have. But um, let's talk about yeah. stuff that's out this week. I don't. I didn't put too much in here. I think there is like more stuff that's out. But 
like we i don't think we talked about sonic superstars but i think that game is out yeah i i don't love the art style of it unfortunately i'm more of a 2d pixel art uh, sonic fan like i loved uh, sonic mania but the fact that it's like kind of 2d 3d Mm. i don't know I, it's something about it just like i i don't want to look at that for long amounts of time <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask you because you're between the two of us you're the the sonic guy so i was yeah, gonna ask if I, it was something I you am were holding out hope in. for another 2d one uh i mean it, this technically is 2d but the pixel art i think is the sweet spot for sonic it's tried to do other things and i feel like it has not done i mean people have said that that what was that sonic game that came out that was like uh 3d recently Oh yeah, um, Sonic Infinite. No, Sonic Frontiers. Frontiers. That was it. People, I read some reviews where people were like, "Hey, this is kind of janky, but it's actually pretty fun." Um, and so maybe that was a success. And I, but I've not checked that out. But my yeah. heart is always going to be at those pixel art two uh, D Mario's like Sonic Mania. But mm-hmm. yeah, I have. I'm probably not going to check this out. <laughs> Well, so Dave the Diver, which I am kind of curious about, uh, did come to Switch this last week as we're recording this, and that game looks kind of cool. I kind of wouldn't mind checking it out at some point, but uh, too much going on right now, so I'm going to have to hold off on that. And then uh, Alan yeah, Wake the, 2. Yeah, the big one this week is Alan Wake 2. Yeah. Um, have you gotten a chance to watch any of this? I watched the, so they had an extended gameplay segment in that Microsoft showcase or whatever, the the partner showcase, and they showed a very cool looking monster that was very unique where it was like a, it was like a woman who comes out of a puddle, but the puddle is a reflection of her. So like she comes out of the puddle and then below her is the reflection, but that's also her. So it's like a weird uh, two-sided uh, ghost enemy thing, but uh, that was very cool. I love control. We've talked about this a bunch on um, the podcast, but I don't know. Alan Wake 2 maybe looks too scary for me, even though I'm interested in the lore implica- implications, but uh, mm-hmm. I probably am not going to check this out. I might watch a playthrough of it, though. Yeah, I think it's getting pretty good reviews, but uh, it is not a game for me, for sure. So <laughs> I'm going to have to pass on that. And then uh, next week... Uh, that uh, Star Ocean Second Story R is coming out. So maybe I will have picked it up and have some impressions on it on the show next week. I'm not sure if I'll Mm. have time to get around to it, but we'll see. Um, Did we want to talk about what we're playing watching before we jump into our feature for this week? Let's do the feature, although I have a reveal for you. I had a lot of trouble thinking of movies because every movie I thought of that was good for Halloween was also kind of scary. And I also don't really watch a lot of scary movies. So I have a solid games list, but okay. uh, I, I got, don't have a solid movies list. I've got cheats on my, uh, my movies list so we can, uh, we'll have plenty uh, for people to see. So or let's do games first. And then I might just cede time to you for the movies. Cause I had a lot of trouble thinking of scary, not scary movies. <laughs> okay. Well, and it's worth noting I didn't put these in any specific order, so I'm we're just gonna do like five of them, but they're not like oh, mine are in order. Oh, are they? Okay, well yeah. I I can <laughs> I can do them in an order, but I didn't like rank them from one to five or anything like that. So, but I can go in. I can we'll we'll do the five, four, three, two, one thing. So what's so what's your number five game for My number a spooky five. game? For spooky but non-horror games, uh, good for Halloween is Rogue Lords, which is that game. Oh, I think we did a yeah, we did a video on yeah, it's classic on monster movie things. Yeah, it just brings in the the you know like your Dracula, the headless horseman, and that kind of character, and you sort of play as the devil, and you have the the ability to sort of uh, burn your uh, your sort of life force to sort of cheat. Because you have this like godlike power to be able to cheat and sort of if one of your characters has taken a lot of damage, you can sort of use that pool of health that you have to cheat and um, regain some health for like Dracula if he's taken some damage. But uh, of course, if you're if your characters sort of run out of health and start taking more damage then your pool of health goes down and you will eventually fail. But it's basically set up sort of a roguelike-style, turn-based uh, RPG kind of a thing 
uh, but very much like uh, Slay the Spire is how the game is sort of structured. So if you like Slay the Spire, but you want sort of a more uh, Halloween themed version of that, this one's actually uh, pretty fun. And it's I think it's on just about everything. I, I do believe it's on Switch and it's definitely on PS5 and on PC. But uh, so that's my number five. What's your number five? So this is a scary game. Uh, it's one that I did not play but I watched someone play, but this game has a special feature where you can turn off all of the enemies that would attack you. So it's basically just a walking simulator, but huh. the story of it is so good. Very creepy. And that is Soma, oh, which yeah. is a game where you are sort of playing at the bottom of the ocean. I don't want to give too much away about the, the plot of it, but the way it unfolds is very interesting. And I, the playthrough that I watched of it, they didn't turn off the enemies every like, there's like a couple of segments where there's like kind of a slow moving zombie esque thing that you have to avoid. And that can be pretty scary. But again, you can turn that off in the settings and just have the story. And it's a very good spooky story with a very interesting ending. Um, so it's a little bit hmm. of a cheat because you can turn it off, but that's my number five. I think if I were to play it, I probably would turn it off. But <laughs> I would too. Uh, what's your number four? Number four is Pumpkin Jack, which oh, I, yeah. I think we've talked about on the show. But yeah, it's basically Jack, sort of the Pumpkin King. It's very heavily inspired by like Nightmare Before Christmas, but it's like an old, um, like retro style, almost N64 era sort of uh, 3D platforming collectathon style game that uh, I had a lot of fun playing a few years ago. It's a little bit floaty, so it's not like the tightest controls you've ever played, but. If you're looking for, if you're like a big sort of Tim Burton fan and you like the sort of old style classic, uh, you know, platforming style game, uh, this one's like pretty fun. Try to get it on sale and it's definitely worth uh, a quick little playthrough. What's your number four? I think something that makes a game scary is that it takes a lot of the power away from the player. So like um, Amnesia, for instance, is a game where you basically don't have weapons and you just have to run away. A lot of scary games I feel like are scary because they don't empower the player and you just sort of have to live in this world. But to flip that, I my number four is a game where you are the thing that is the most powerful, uh, and that is Doom 2016. Ooh, uh, yeah, that's a great a good little one. game, lots of spooky imagery, and you know you're fighting demons, but basically you're more powerful than everything else. So you get the spookiness of like the crazy hell dimension or whatever but you're also you're never really I, I when i was playing that game at least i was never super afraid there are definitely some creepy things that happen but sure. then you can just shoot everything with a shotgun <laughs> um, and i i love that game i I, th I think i like it more than doom eternal doom eternal i felt like added a little many too many aspects to gameplay there were like extra things that you could do where it just became a little bit too much for me to manage but doom 2016 i feel like is such a solid game level based so you can you know put it down if it's being too much for you but uh yeah it's also very gory so that's yeah. like a kind of a halloween thing but that's my number four what's your number three my number three is ghostwire tokyo which, oh yeah that's a good spooky one yeah it's it's spooky but it's not really what i would call horror because i didn't find it scary necessarily but it's definitely there's definitely a lot of spooky elements to it they try to do a lot of uh stuff where they're like sort of ghostly people and it, it's all has to do with uh you know japanese folklore and so you've got a lot of like crazy creepy creatures but basically you're in like you know nighttime tokyo and this sort of spiritual apocalypse and you're going around it's kind of a a collectathon uh, similar to like an old school style collectathon where you're going around collecting the the souls of the people that have died and you're sort of taking them to a phone booth and releasing them sort of to the other side that where they're supposed to go they're sort of trapped a little bit in this um weird situation that's going on in tokyo uh but yeah you're definitely battling a lot of uh crazy japanese folklore creatures and you're you have these crazy hand powers that you're throwing basically magic at them 
And I just had a really fun time. I, I would like put on a show and just like go around the open world exploring and collecting stuff and occasionally fighting some uh, weird demon looking creatures. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So I do recommend Ghostwire Tokyo. I haven't played any of the new content. They released some new stuff to it, but I have not. They're making that sequel, that. right? Well, supposedly that was one of the things that was in that leaked Microsoft thing is that they might do a uh, Ghostwire Tokyo 2, but I don't know if it was successful enough uh, mm. for them to do a second one, but they, it might still be on the table. So uh, that's my number three. What's your number two, three? Well, what number are uh, we on for you? <laughs> technically both. It's a, it's a three, but it is a sequel to a game. Um, this is not a horror game, but it has a lot of horror elements. And specifically, one chapter is very horror-centric. But throughout this entire game, I feel like there are really creepy moments. And that game is Half-Life 2. Mm. A great little game that... Uh, I mean, it's iconic at this point. It was like a revelation when it came out. But... Uh, a lot of like it's interesting because the game sort of pushes you from kind of set piece to set piece but in the middle of those a lot of times you're just alone especially if you're like trying to solve a physics puzzle you'll just be like in a room like you'll get done talking to someone and then something will happen some kind of crazy disaster will happen and you're sort of shunted off to be alone and obviously Ravenholm is the big scary part of it um but even in the first parts of it, like after you get done, there's like kind of tension moments where you're running from the, I forget what they call it in that game, like the whatever the Metropolitan Police are, the crazy police force. But um, there's a lot of cool, spooky elements in Half-Life 2. Even I would th- say more so in Half-Life uh, in the episodes one and two, uh, and some in Alex, but nobody has a, a VR headset that plays out. <laughs> but Half-Life 2 is my number three because mainly about Ravenholm, but that whole game has super creepy stuff in it. What's your number two? My number two is, I bet this is on your list, but Luigi's Mansion 3. Interesting. Or any of them in parentheses is what I've put down. Uh, Because obviously there are three of them, but specifically Luigi's Mansion 3 is so good on the Switch. Uh, I don't know. I just really liked going around... uh, completing the levels it's basically like you have instead of a a regular mansion you have like a giant hotel and each floor is like a a different amusement park theme basically basically um i I, one of my favorite switch games uh so definitely high on my list of uh switch for this generation of nintendo console i i'm curious if this is on your list you'll you may never know because (laughs) my number two is again a sequel it is, and I talk about this game all the time on the podcast, but Thief 2 is Thief 2 the Metal Age. And uh, that is just like, it's dripping in just like a spooky atmosphere the whole time because uh, there's like weird eldritch horror things and like uh, cults and things like that. And it's one of the games that scared me the most. I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but I was in a level and I had basically knocked everyone out and was sort of just had my free reign of the level. And I was collecting stuff and making sure all my objectives are done. And then I went into a basement and there were like catacombs and pretty soundlessly, all of a sudden, this like undead thing turned a corner. And I was looking directly at it and it scared me so much that I just like quit out of the game for a while. Um, but it's not necessarily a horror game, but there are like super, I mean, the whole thing is sneaking around. So there's a whole atmosphere of like tense, like, are they going to find me or whatever throughout the whole game? And I think just like the, the setting is so atmospheric and good, the like voiceover from your guy and the music. And also it's just like, it's a, it's a game about hiding in the dark. So everything is like kind of poorly lit and you're kind of mm-hmm. slinking through the shadows. Yeah. So I think it's a, a great little Halloween thing to get. And also Thief 1 as well is even more magic focused. Thief 2 kind of gets into like robots, steampunk stuff. But Thief 1, uh, the dark project is another like super spooky game where there's way more like weird monsters and things to interact with. But both of them I think are solid. Hit me with that number one. My number one is a game I played through earlier this year, and it's Evil West. Whoa. Which I platinumed on PS5. And it is obviously, like, very, uh, it's a little bit 
I compared it, I think, to like Doom in that you're getting a bunch of different weapons that you're upgrading and they they all are like sort of different category of weapon and that it's fun to use them all. Um, and you also like will damage enemies until they start glowing and then you can do like some sort of finisher on them. So it's, mm-hmm. it's similar to that, but it's also like kind of an old school like level based game where you're going around and there are different collectibles in each level to find and it's but it's pretty linear um but yeah it's kind of like a western but also uh you're you're taking out like vampires and crazy sort of creatures along the way and it is it gets pretty tough if you're playing on the hardest difficulty but there's like a very easy mode as well that you'll basically never (laughs) die on so like it sort of works for pretty much any skill level Mm. um and it is a lot of fun to play especially if you like i i compared it i think a little bit to god of war as well because like the the positioning of the camera behind the Mm. character and sort of the way he moves and i think even the way the controls are set up felt a lot like playing god of war uh, and god of war ragnarok but with this sort of uh doom style uh weapon system but yeah it was a it was a very cool game that i think didn't get enough credit or mention when it came out and i kind of hope that they stick with it and make an evil west too because i would definitely play it but what is your number one zach this is a game that i think i played last year great for halloween very spooky but also like not too scary i'm talking about luigi's mansion 3 whoa i couldn't have seen this coming yeah so we pretty much you said everything i was going to say about it but yeah it's great the music is wonderful um great to play with a friend you can just go back and forth and like swap out levels or whatever um luigi is uh, great luigi's great gooigi is great i would assume they're gonna make a fourth one because i think everyone loved the third one and that second one's coming out for switch pretty soon i think yeah it did Um, i think it did pretty well so i i would definitely hope and the fact that they're bringing back other ones as well like they're bringing back the second one for uh the switch as well and i think the first one maybe that's not on i didn't see it the will first eventually one. i know the it will eventually come to once they do like gamecube games yeah but yeah what is your number five i guess we don't have numbers for the movies ones i have zero i don't i couldn't think of any okay well i have enough for both of us so i guess i'll just run down well actually before i even do that i'll do honorable mention uh for games is that lost in random game do you remember that Mm. one oh yeah with the dice yeah it's like an interesting sort of third person combat game but also it has like some sort of dice mechanic in it as well but it's like very tim burton style game just like and it's visual art style so i recommend that as well uh but for movies um army of darkness is probably not necessarily a halloween style movie but it is a good option yeah a pretty good option for somebody uh that doesn't love horror and then i mean obviously ghostbusters is an easy one to throw yeah, out there very true um and then i've got uh what we do in the shadows the, uh, the oh movie. yeah man you have a lot of good ones uh the movie or, and the tv show by the way there's like what five seasons mm-hmm. of the tv show at this point i mean i could throw garth Marenghi's dark place in there as another tv show oh, wonderful just rewatch that and it still holds up so well yeah, and then I actually do like the old like '60s Adams Family TV show as well that's mm. out there that you could watch. But other ones on my list, so uh, the Mel Brooks like comedy Halloween movies of uh, uh, Dracula, Dead and Loving It, and Young Frankenstein are. Oh, sort Young of a, Frankenstein's a good one. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, Dr- Dracula, Dead and Loving It. Is it? Um, is it similar? It's similar. It's uh, with that guy, right? From uh police cat or not police academy um, yeah leslie nielsen is, plays yeah. dracula and mel brooks plays uh dr van helsing and uh yeah there's definitely some funny stuff going on in that movie so check that one out and then i kind of have this all lumped together as one even though it's it, it 
shouldn't be it's like many things but the the leica animated film so like the box trolls Coraline, and paranorman sort of mm. work for this but the that i have included in that the tim burton collection even though i i want to say these are like vaguely related but not where you have like frank and weenie corpse bride and um the nightmare before christmas and things mm. like that because they're all like those that like stop motion animation uh, style of movie. I think that all works for this. But then I also really like uh, Sleepy Hollow as like. Oh, one that's yeah, not, that's a classic. That's like not too scary, but it is sort of a, a good Halloween movie. Yeah. Um, and I, I think movies that also work f- for like Halloween, but not super spooky is like Edward Scissorhands and Beetlejuice and like The Nightmare Before Christmas, that kind of thing. I think all of that works. Yeah, these are all great options. So I don't know why I couldn't go. think of any of these. There's a long list of Halloween movies for non-horror fans worth checking out. Um, do you want to talk Super Mario Brothers Wonder? Yeah, I'm still really liking it. Uh, it seems like it is crazy that like every level, it seems like there's something new and interesting. As opposed to like previous uh, 2D Mario's. It's like a little bit samey where like maybe you get to a different zone and all those zones are a variation on a theme. But I feel like every single level I've played has some sort of new, interesting thing. In addition to also having the Wonder Seed is like a new and interesting thing. So it's just like it's packed with ideas. It's crazy how unique every level is. That's like the thing that's most impacted me. Yeah, especially uh, like later on, they they get like really crazy. I sent you a picture of like one of the, the oh yeah the parts where it's like uh, basically the the level has gone into shadow, but you're like super tall, like you have a super long body that's like elongated, and you you can like duck to crouch down to go under stuff, but you're just like. It's like they get really weird and creative with these. Uh, I'm excited levels. to play more of it. Um, have you gotten to see all the new power ups? Because there's like Elephant Mario, Bubble Mario, and Drill Hat Mario. I have not run into Drill yet, but I have played a lot with uh, Bubble and uh, Elephant Mario. I think my favorite might be the Drill. I'm excited to get to that. Because, yeah, you can drill down underground so you can go under enemies and that, or, like, blocks and things. And then you jump up and you can take them all out or, you know, break the boxes. And so that I found to be really fun. Mm. Um, this is the first game with the new Mario voice actor. Yeah. Um, pretty noticeable, I thought, once I got into it. I didn't think I would notice, but somehow I do. Especially with Mario. Less with Luigi. I think well, I've Luigi been playing mostly like, as Luigi. But. Yeah, Luigi screws up his voice enough where it's pretty... I mean, anybody can do a Luigi impression, kind of, because you just, like, are yeah. so insane. Uh, and then, like, the standees, I thought, was, like, a fun, interesting idea that, like, we joke about how it makes it a strand game. But yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, if you are at a tough part, you put your standee down. And then, like, I've noticed as I was playing just the other day, like, I'll be in a different level and I'll, I'll see a little message that'll pop up in the lower left hand side of the screen that's like, somebody was rescued by your standee. Here's some more points for you for you. And it's just like. It's cool stuff like that, that that makes it kind of like a multiplayer game, even though it's kind of not, um, if, at least if you're playing by yourself. Um, and you can play still in the online mode when you have like two player co-op going on. Um, but I think once you get to three and four players, it stops letting you play it online because at that point, I think maybe yeah. they will only let four players in one level at a time. Makes sense. Um, it does get a little chaotic with three and four players, <laughs> uh, as you might imagine, uh, because it weirdly like assigns the the camera movement to one player and not all of them. Uh, so like it, whoever made it to the pole uh, at the end of a level and was highest on the pole is like awarded the crown, basically. And that player then is like the leader of the group for the foreseeable future until the next person who ends up at the top of the pole. And so you'll go into a level. And so like before you go into a level, actually um, when you're clicking through dialogue, whoever has that crown is the person clicking through the dialogue. And then when you get into a level, the camera follows the person with the crown 
and I've had some levels where it like hmm. was dynamically changing depending on who was like furthest along, but it, it seemed like for the most part it was hmm. whoever had made it highest on the pole. Maybe that's just you know one experience, but um, it does get chaotic because it's possible for the other players to like fall behind and or maybe they're trying to collect something like some coins or something on the left side of the screen, but the person with the crown is just advancing ahead and it just kind of pulls them along because they end up at the back of the the screen and it just pushes them along. And so they may very easily die in that way. (laughs) So it does get kind of chaotic and rough at times. I don't know how they can fix that uh, when you're playing local co-op. Like, I don't know how you would fix that unless you, I don't know, find a way to sort of, like the the old Lego games did where it sort of splits the screen. But even then, I don't know. I'm not sure what the solution is to that, but it it does make it harder to, to play a little bit. But Interesting. the funniest line I heard from the flower voice guy that people seem to hate, which you can turn off in the settings, by the way, the, the you know, the weird voice flower dude. Yeah. Um, the funniest line I heard from him was like during one of the wonder sections, uh, I like passed by him and he, he just kind of goes a lot going on, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like it just like really cracked me up for some reason. He was just like kind of a lot going on here. Huh? And I was like, yep, definitely is a lot happening at this <laughs> moment. But I, I don't know why that cracked me up, but it did. Anyway, I, I, I really would never turn him it. off. I find him to be very funny. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, I, I don't mind the flower uh, voice guy, but some people seem to not like him, but. Uh, yeah, there's the, the whole gotta catch them all on the standees. There's like 144 of them. And every time you go to one of those shops, you spend the like purple gem coin things you're picking up to like yeah. get more of them. And so I don't know if that's sort of compelling for people to try to unlock all of those options, but yeah, I don't know. I've been enjoying it quite a bit. I'm excited to play more of it. Um, it's blown me away when I've been able to play it. Uh, let's talk Iron Chef. Zach, I used to watch this all the time when I was in high school. It was on the Food Channel, and it's just, I'm not, uh, let's talk about, make sure we're talking about the right thing. We're not talking about American Iron Chef, which I find to be not great. A lot of American <laughs> uh, reality TV is like focuses on the drama mm-hmm. and like things going wrong. Whereas in Iron Chef, it's just about people making good food or weird food sometimes. And just like having a good time. Actually, I watched an episode last night where they don't mention it at all. But the challenger like cuts his thumb at one point is not mentioned at all. You can just in the background see he's getting it like taped up. And I feel like in the American version of it, that would have been like a huge music sting where it's like, oh, my God, this guy cut his thumb. What's going to happen? But None of that. It's just like a really chill thing to watch. And someone has been uploading all of them to YouTube in their full, uh, like, 42-minute segments. Um, and I have been loving watching them. And I sent you one. Uh, did you, you? I think I sent you the Piglet Battle. <laughs> yeah, I didn't finish it because I didn't have time at the time. But I started it. And there was that great uh, moment that has been turned into a GIF where... At the beginning, as they're doing sort of all the setup and intros and everything, like the main guy, like just grabs a a yellow pepper off of a plate and picks it up and takes a big bite out of it. And then just like slowly turns to the camera and smiles in like a really funny, weird uh, way. I I love stuff like that. I don't know why. I just think it's hilarious. But it's great. A lot of it. I mean, it's so interesting. It's also so much of a time capsule because I think it was shot in the 90s. Uh, or maybe the early 2000s, I'm not sure, but uh, it's very good, and it's very chill, and the commentators, it's all dubbed, so, like, the, it happened in Japanese, but the dubbing is really interesting, because they, like, talk over themselves. I'm very, I would be very interested to watch, like, a little documentary about how they westernized it, uh, yeah. because, like, sometimes, I think they're saying everything that the people in the original are saying, like, verbatim. Because sometimes someone will be like, well, this is happening. Oh, actually, I'm wrong. No, this is happening. And like people are talking over each other. They make it sound really natural, even though I think they are just repeating what everyone said. And I think that could have the – it could accidentally become like uh, too manufactured or it like seemed fake. But they make it seem really real. 
Um, but it's great. And that's actually, it, it, that is my parting wisdom for this week is check out Iron Chef Classic on YouTube. If you search for it, you should see there's some channel that's called like Cinefilm or something television that's uploading all of them. And they're great to watch. They're great to throw on if you're like making dinner because it will make you hungry. <laughs> um, but it's also just like a super chill, funny show that uh, I feel I like the American version is bad. It is. It's very campy. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, sometimes it's over. The, I watched one where uh, the challenger had like, oh, this challenger is having troubles at home that he says. And then it's revealed in the episode like, oh, well, uh, it seems like he's been separated from his wife. And then the uh, what's it, the announcer guy's like, oh, I'm being handed a letter that's being that's written from his wife. I'm going to read it aloud. And the letter is like, hey, honey, uh, win this and you can come home or something like that. <laughs> and it's just like clearly not real. But uh, it's I don't know. I, I love it. I, I love I, to I watch will, it. It's, it's I, so I will good. always opt for camp over actual drama. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if they did like a, a fake version of like those, you know, real, you know, drama shows or whatever. Uh, and, but it, instead of it being real, it was just very campy. I think that would be funny. Well, I think but. the one I sent you, it was even more camp because the chairman, the guy in charge, this is all like, you know, narrative or whatever, but he had lost the Iron Chefs had lost like the last six matches or something. So he was like mad. So he was boycotting the proceedings. And every once in a while throughout the episode, like the announcer will be like, we're getting word that Chairman Kaga is somewhere in the building and there will be a camera shot of him like behind a curtain, like sipping a wine, looking like worried or whatever. It's it's great. Like everything about it is great. There's these little subplots sometimes, but that's my part in wisdom is definitely check out classic American Iron Chef. If you see Bobby <laughs> Flay, don't watch it because he's in the bad one. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, so... I guess with that being your parting wisdom, or did you have additional parting wisdom? No, that's it. I Iron Chef is great, and everyone should check it out on YouTube. Hopefully they never take it down. Yeah. So on that note, go ahead and follow us uh, on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Starside Cafe, and catch you on the next one. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>